Okay, welcome to lecture 9.2. I'm going to introduce the idea of generalized forces. And so this is actually the probably the piece where we first uh, introduce uh, the concepts that make um, the method of obtaining the equations of motion um, from Kane and Levinson's book, um, the so-called Kane's approach or Kane's equations. Um, this is where we finally get to see what that's all about. Everything we've done so far are um, sort of standard in terms of understanding the uh, properties of the uh, forces, the mass distribution, and the kinematics of the system. Um, there's some elements there that are in the presentation that um, um, are maybe different and align with the Keynes approach, but uh, this is really going to be the meat of it and pull all of the things together so we can see how we're going to arrive at the equations of motion for a multi-body system. So the topic is generalized forces. Okay, but the first thing that we have to discuss is a bit more about uh, kinematics. And we're going to introduce the idea of partial velocities. All right, so every velocity, angular or linear, expressed in terms of generalized speeds can be written like so. So if I have um, a holonomic system, with generalized speeds, u1 to un, in a reference frame in, and we'll have different velocities of points. All right, so for example, the velocity of P and N. And you can write that velocity as a sum over all N uh, of the generalized speeds. UR times VR. Um, I think I have that written wrong. R equals one to n, not i, of uh, the general the rth generalized speed times um, velocity vector here, which I have a subscript r for plus a term subscript t and n. All right. So what does this uh, mean here? The first thing here, these these are the that's the rth generalized speed. And remember that velocities are linear in the generalized speeds. And then this term is called the rth partial velocity. of point P and reference frame N, okay? And then this term, we call the remainder. 
Similarly, any um, angular velocity can also be written in the same way. So we can write any velocity, angular or not, in terms of these linear combinations of the generalized speeds and um, these partial velocity vectors. And then we would call this one the arth angular, oh, sorry, the arth partial angular velocity. in in all right so um, graphically what does this look like if I have some uh, velocity vector call it that of a point P And then we have, this is the velocity of P and N, for example. Then um, you can write this um, as a vector sum of its partial velocities. So here we would have um, the, general, the first generalized speed times the first partial velocity of P and N, and then this one second. Third. Fourth par partial velocity. P and N, and then finally uh, you may have a remainder term there. So sum of these uh, components, we can divide uh, any velocity vector we want into these partial velocities times a generalized speed. Right. So these partial velocities here. Um, they show how the velocity of P and N will change if the associated generalized speed U of R changes. You can think of these partial velocities as um, the sensitivities of that particular velocity vector to uh, unit changes in the generalized speeds. Right. And so since this velocity vector is linear um, in the U's, in the generalized speeds, then um, it's also true here that the partial velocity is can be written as a partial derivative. So if I take the partial derivative of that velocity vector in the in frame with respect to the rth generalized speed, I will get that partial velocity. Right? It's going to be the coefficient of each of these terms. So these are called partials, partial velocities because they are 
uh, these partial derivatives. I write A or B up there. B. Okay, so you can, if you have that velocity vector, you can take this partial derivative and you will have your partial velocity uh, term. And um, these give you an idea, like if I were to vary u1, I can see how that's going to affect the total velocity of p and n, and I can do that for any of the other ones, u2, u3, u4. So these are going to um, allow us to think about how the generalized speeds affect the motion of the system, and we're going to connect them uh, further to the forces that are also affecting the motion of the system. So let's uh, first do an example where we um, calculate the partial velocities. So this is actually from um, figure 2.61 in Kane and Levinson's book. on page 29. Alright, so this system looks like this. There's a, um, you can think of this rectangle or parallel uh, that I'm drawing as a sort of a door on a hinge. And it is rotating um, at a constant velocity. omega, right? So the angle in there would be omega times t. And um, this is called b. This is called reference frame a. And uh, let's put some unit vectors to those. Draw those in blue. This is ax and a y and I'll do b x and also b y and normal to that is going to be bz, so bx, bc, and this is also by. Rotates about by um, to get b rotated from a, simple rotation. And then in this uh, door, b or this plane, um, there are a couple of points, so p1 and P2, and the distance between P1 and P2 are fixed, and uh, that dimension is L, capital L, and then we also have a reference frame E attached to this line, so I'll put the unit vectors here, that's EX, and then in the plane EY, and then out of the plane EZ. So EZ, EX, and EY. This angle is going to be Q3. 
and then um, the distances from here to here is I want Q1 and this distance is Q2. <laughs> Label this as the new reference frame E. Okay. Do I have everything on the picture that I want? I think so. Omega is constant in this case. All right, so that's the basic setup. Um, these two points uh, can move on this plane B, right? They are fixed though at a, a fixed distance L between uh, between the two, but they can slide around, rotate, or whatever on this plane, and we track their locations by Q1, Q2, um, and Q3 will give us uh, unique generalized coordinates to um, map those. And then um, we've got this other coordinate here, but it is not a generalized coordinate. It's just uh, that omega is constant, so omega times t will give us the angle of that rotation about a y b y all right so um, that's the problem setup and you can check the book if you want to see uh, more details about that but um, we can write uh, the velocity of p1 in a for example and um, i can write this as q1 dot bx plus q2 dot vy minus omega q1 bc. Okay, so that's the velocity of p1 and a. Uh, but we could also express this in the reference frames a and e, which I'll do. So the velocity, uh, the same velocity um, expressed in e would look like q1 uh, dot cosine of th uh, q3 plus q2 dot sine of q3 in the ex direction uh, plus uh, negative q1 dot sine of q3 plus q2 dot cosine of q3 in the ey direction minus omega q1 ez since ez is the same BC. You can also write it in the A frame or express it in the A frame. Q1 dot cos omega t um, minus omega Q1 sine omega t in the AX direction plus uh, Q2 dot and the AY and uh, minus Q1 dot sine omega T plus omega Q1 cosine omega T in the AZ direction. Okay, so same velocity, you can express it in the B, E, or A frame. So let's try to calculate the partial velocities um, of P1 and A, right? Given some different choices in the um, generalized speeds. So I think I have enough room here. So case one, Let's just use the simple definitions. Q1 dot uh, equals U1, U2 equals Q2 dot, and U3 equals Q3 dot. So then I can rewrite my velocity of P1 and A 
So u1 bx uh, plus u2 by, and then minus omega q1 bz. All right. So the partial velocities, you can find them by inspection, or you can take uh, the partial partial derivatives. Okay, so when you're using SymPy, you'll probably use the partial derivative because uh, that's easier to extract the coefficients you need. But here, on a piece of paper, I can I can uh, extract the partial velocities directly by inspection. Right. So, for example, the first partial velocity of p1 and a is going to be um, whatever is multiplied by u1. So bx, and then I can do whatever is multiplied by u2, by, and whatever is multiplied by u3. In this case, we don't have a u3, so 0. And then we do have a remainder term here for the partial velocities. Uh, P1 and A, and that is negative omega Q1 B C. So the partial velocities are vectors, and they're just simply the coefficients to the generalized speeds. The velocity should be linear in the generalized speeds, and then you can grab whatever's left for the remainder portion there. All right, so that's uh, all it is to it for getting the partial velocities of P1 and A. Um, but notice though, if I choose a different set of generalized speeds, um, we'll do U1 equals Q1 dot cosine Q3 uh, plus Q2 dot sine of Q3. And then I'll set u2 equal to q2 dot cosine of q3 minus q1 dot sine of q3. And then u3 equals um, q3 dot, the same as before. So these are the measure numbers here of the um, velocity p1 and a expressed in e in that case. So then we can write the velocity of P1 and A equals U1 EX um, plus U2 EY minus omega Q1 EC. Right? So if I go through by inspection and get the partials, well, they're going to be different now because I've chosen a different set of definitions for my generalized speeds but also easy to obtain. I just find the coefficients of each u. And I get my new set of partial velocities. Okay, so that's just to show that they are dependent on the generalized speeds that you choose, how you define those, um, and you will get different partial velocities. All right. Okay, so that's the basic idea. It's not. It's pretty straightforward. Um, you're just extracting coefficients and simplify, and we can show that later. You can extract those using the uh, partial derivative command. Um, so those were all the. Um, so these uh, linear velocities of, of P1. Um, similarly, we can do it for an angular velocity. So angular velocity of E and A is the angular velocity of B and A plus the angular velocity of E and B. And that, if we write it in terms of the Express it in the E-frame, I've got omega sine of Q3 in the E-X plus omega cosine of Q3 in the E-Y plus U3 in the E-Z uh, direction, Z direction.
So similarly, I can take the coefficients, I'm sorry, E of A. Well, we don't have any U1. We don't have any U2. But we do have a U3. So the third partial velocity of omega E in A is going to be E Z. And then the remainder term are the two terms with no use. Right. So that's calculating the partial velocities of um, the system. If you get your velocities correct, you express them in terms fully in terms of the uh, generalized speeds, and then you extract the coefficients or take the partial derivatives to get all of the partial velocities. Right. So that is the uh, main idea there. So how do we use these and why do they matter? That's the next step. So um, given a holonomic system, for example, I'll just say multibody system. A force applied to that multibody system in general will cause everything to move. So let's take an example system. If I uh, have a um, a multi-particle pendulum, a simple pendulum here. So so let's say I have these uh, three particles, P1, P2, and P3, attached in a uh, multi-body pendulum, and um, they can swing relative to this um, uh, ceiling here. If I pick some point, we'll call it Q, and then I apply a force there, this force is going to cause all of these links um, to have some motion. Right? So if I push here, I'm going to get motion in all of the links, and thus all of the angles. So if I call um, the angles, our generalized coordinates, um, QI, right, the angles of each of the links, and then I were to pick some generalized speeds, making the simple choice that each one is the uh, time derivative of the Q. I have a, a basic multi-body system here. So just to note what I said, if we apply F at Q, then all the links move, and that means all of the U's will change. All of the generalized speeds will change. But for that given force, how much will they change? partial velocities that we introduced in the previous uh, part are going to be the answer to this question. <laughs>
new page. So let's think about this a little bit further. Suppose that the velocity of P in N is the velocity of a particle. with a mass of m um, that is acted on by a force f. All right? And that force f causes an acceleration. All right, that is the time derivative of that velocity p in n with respect to t, and then in some reference frame n, for example. And the change in the velocity corresponds to changes in the generalized speeds. So, which occurs with changes in the generalized speeds. The use, okay. And that's because velocity B and N equals some linear combination of the generalized speeds times the partial velocity. Okay. Now, let's sketch out a little figure. We've got our particle P, mass M, and I'll have some force vector acting on it. And so we're going to get a change in its velocity with that force vector. If the velocity vector happens to look like this at that instant in time, the velocity of p in n, for example, um, then we can sketch out similarly. Um, I'll use uh, orange some components here. I'll just make them three to keep it simple. Uh, of the partial velocities uh, multiplied by each of the... So I can write u2, v2, u3, v3, for example. All right, so I have these partial velocities that are associated with the sensitivities of the velocity to each of the generalized speeds, and then I've got a force applied to this, okay? You can think of then that uh, The velocity, the partial velocity, the rth partial velocity, is the direction or component of the force F that causes the rth partial velocity to change, right? And that's going to be the change in time of the rth partial velocity is u r dot, right? And you can write that out too. Like you can think of that if I have the force divided by the mass of the particle, this is uh, an acceleration. 
type of term according to Newton's law. If I dot it in the direction of a partial velocity, then I'm going to get some result here that is a scalar result that's only going to have a ur dot here in it. And that ur dot will be a function of, it can be a function of all the u's, so uh, all the q's and time. Uh, but I get this function here in this case of. Um, So if I have a single particle force acting on it, then I'll get uh, a unique function with only the ur dot there. So this uh, projection of the force into these partial velocity directions are going to show us how this force has affects change in the different generalized speeds. Right? Um, if that partial velocity happens to be perpendicular to the force, then uh, F doesn't cause any change in R, uh, cause any change in that generalized speed. So it doesn't cause UR to change. So this is sort of a dynamic interpretation of how you're you know, mapping the relationship um, of a force applied to a particle to these um, uh, change it to the change in the velocity vector when we have the velocity vector described as a linear combination of um, partial velocities times the generalized speed. All right. So with all of that in mind, we can introduce um, the two new concepts um, that I named the title of this lecture, Generalized Forces. The first one we call Generalized active forces. Right. So suppose we have a holonomic system And this is going to be made up of new particles with generalized speeds u1 to un. And and thus in degrees of freedom. And then we need to say in a reference frame of some sort. All right, so it has in degrees of freedom in reference frames A. We've got these generalized speeds that we've defined, and there's new uh, particles. Um, then we're going to define. the arth holonomic generalized active force. And then in A as this. So we say the arth generalized force is defined as the sum from i equals 1 to n, the sum of the particles of the velocity of that ith particle, 
in the reference frame A dotted with the resultant on the ith particle. And then we can make a generalized uh, active force for r equals 1 to n, 1 for each of the generalized speeds. Okay, So that there is the rth holonomic partial velocity. And I forgot to put r here, sorry. Uh, Okay, so where were we at? Sorry for the crash. Earth holonomic partial uh, velocity of that particular particle. And um, this, I said, was the uh, resultant force on the ith particle. So on pi. Yeah. All right, what do we want to notice about this? So, um, the rth generalized active force, and I'm going to use GAF uh, to, uh, as an acronym there. Um, it's a scalar value. Right? And then um, it uh, contains contributions. from all particles in the system. Unless uh, any given per particle velocity, partial velocity, is perpendicular to that force. So if that's the case, um, it would be zero. that particular particle's contribution. And then um, FR corresponds to the rth generalized speed. Right? All right, so this is our generalized active force, and it gives a projection of the forces acting on the particle into these partial to velocity directions so that we can construct how um, any given, uh, all of the forces acting on all of the particles affect that particular motion in the direction of that uh, associated generalized speed. Okay, so FR captures forcing terms to um, the equations of motion that we will eventually write down in whole. Equations of motion. And uh, it's basically how the contributing forces cause change in the generalized speed, in the generalized speeds. All right. So let's do a little example here so you can see how this works out. So I'll make a, a multi-body system uh, made out of particles. We're going to have a uh, double simple pendulum. <laughs> 
So I have a ceiling and um, a two link pendulum that's going to be made up of uh, two particles P1 with a mass 1 and P2 with mass 2. All right. Each of the uh, pendulums are uh, a length L long. And I'm going to have a uh, coordinate system here that I'll call an X and an Y for a reference frame in. And then I'm going to set up some generalized coordinates. Um, I'm going to measure both of these angles uh, from a vertical line. So I'll have Q1 for the first link and Q2 for the second link. And then lastly, we will have um, a uniform gravitational field of gravitational constant G that's applied to these two particles. All right. So we're going to use um, the simple definition of the generalized speeds. All right. And our goal is to find the generalized active forces F1 and F2 associated with each of those generalized speeds. So let's write the velocities of the two particles. So we're going to have the velocity of particle 1 and in, and that would be L times Q1 dot cosine Q1 and X. I'm just going to write everything in the um, in a reference frame here. And then the velocity of particle 2 and in um, is the velocity of particle 1 and in plus L Q2 dot times uh, cosine of Q2 and X plus sine of Q2 and Y. And um, Now let's do the partial velocities. So we have the, we only need the velocities of the two particles. So the partial velocities, if I uh, do 0.1 first, so this one will be the partial with respect to u1, and I'm going to just substitute uh, q1 dot with u1. Um, then I will get uh, L C1 in X plus S1 in Y. Uh, then with respect to U2, there's no U2 in the velocity um, of P1. And then we've got the velocity of P2 in N. Uh, partial velocity with respect to the first generalized speed and that will be the same as the other particle because it has the same velocity in it uh, c1 nx plus s1 ny and then the partial velocity with respect to the second generalized speed for the second particle is going to be this l times C2 in X plus sine of Q2 in Y. All right. So those are the partial velocities that we're going to need. We've got both particles and two generalized speeds there. All right. Um, let me just go to a new page. So we now need the resultant forces acting on each, each particle. So let's do the forces. 
acting on the two particles. To do so, we're going to draw some free body diagrams. So we've got particle one and particle two. We'll separate them out and then draw the forces that are acting on them. Both of them have gravity. Okay. All right. M1 times G and M2 times G. And then um, they also have some kind of uh, uh, tension or distance forces that keep MP1L uh, from P2 and P1L, uh, distant L from the ceiling. And so we can draw those. And then there's the equal and opposite one on P2 there. Now I'm going to um, call this one T1, magnitude, right? I have the direction drawn by the error, arrow. This one, magnitude T2. And then T2 would be equal and opposite on the two particles there. And then just to note the um, angles, right? This angle is Q2, sorry, Q1. And this angle is Q2. And this angle is Q2. So T1 and T2 are distance forces. And we've talked about them in the prior lesson um, and we'll see some consequences of what they what they are here. Okay, so we've got our two free body diagrams. We've got all the forces. Let's write the resultant on each particle. So the resultant on particle one is going to be that uh, tension force one times cosine of q1 in the ny minus sine of q1 in the nx and then we've got the m1 times g in the uh, negative in y direction right and uh, plus t2 times negative uh, cosine of q2 in y plus sine of q2 in x right so that's the uh, resultant forces acting on P1, and then the resultant forces acting on P2. We've got the gravitational force in the y direction, and then the single uh, tension force there, or distance force. That should look like that. Right. So we've written out our resultant vectors. We've got our partial velocities. We should now be able to figure out the generalized active forces. So let me bring the partial velocities in view. All right. So there we go. We've got the partial velocities and these resultant forces. We should be able to figure out the generalized active forces now. So let's see if I can show them. There we go. So for the first uh, generalized active force, let me write that here. So the ones associated with the first generalized speed, F1, is going to be the velocity of particle 1 in N 
the first partial velocity dotted with the resultant on the first particle plus um, the contribution from the second particle like so. So if we take these dot products you should get that uh, this and I'll just write it out and you can check it yourself T1 S1 plus T2 S2 plus L S1 T1 C1 minus M1 G minus T2 C2 plus LC1 minus T2 S2 plus LS2 sorry LS1 minus M2G plus T2 C2 okay so if you take those dot products you should get this and if you look carefully here there's a lot of pieces of this uh, cancel Right, so I have a uh, LC1, T1, S1 negative, LC1, T1, S1 positive. So that's going to go away. And then LC1, T2, S2, LC1, T2, S2 negative. So that goes away. And then um, LS1, T2, C2, LS1, T2, C2 positive and a negative that goes away so that leaves us with just these terms l s1 m1 g and minus l s1 m2 g equaling negative l s1 g m1 plus m2 so that's the first generalized active force there What's useful to notice is that T1 and T2 are not present. And um, this is not a coincidence. All right, it's not a coincidence. It is, in fact, um, um, a result of us choosing generalized forces and doing these projections that um, T1 and T2 uh, do not contribute to the generalized active forces. Okay, and so that's why they're called non contributing forces. Um, We've already talked about how they don't do any work on the system, and they don't um, affect the how these forces um, affect the motion of the system because they don't do any work. So um, there's our uh, connection to the non-contributing forces. They're going to always drop out like this. Any that follow the three rules that I mentioned in the last lecture which were the contact forces on frictionless surfaces, the rolling without slipping contact forces, and then also these distance forces between uh, particles in a rigid body. And in this case, P1, P2, um, they are, uh, T2 is, for example, the distance force between P1 and P2, and that is going to drop out and not contribute to the system. So you can also uh, get the second generalized active force, and that is going to be um, the partial velocity of P1 with respect to N, the second partial velocity dotted with R1, plus the partial velocity of the second particle, um, 2 dotted with R2. And then this is 0, so that whole thing goes to 0. And then you only have this last part. And that ends up being um, L cosine q2 minus t2 s2 
plus L S2 minus M2 G plus T2 C2. And then if we see there, we've got L C T2 C2 minus, and then a plus version, those uh, cancel out. And then we're left with F2 equals L S2, uh, that's a minus M2 G. So there's the second generalized active force. All right. So that's how you calculate them for a system of part particles. And um, the um, another thing to note here is that note the units of the generalized active forces here are um, force times length type of units. Okay. And uh, this um, this is because um, Q1, Q2 are angles, right? If um, Q is a length, sorry, is a distance. Then uh, the uh, associated generalized active force um, will have units of force. Okay, so you get these scalar values of either a Newton meter type of um, thing if you choose angles as your generalized coordinates and then angular rates uh, in the uh, of the generalized speeds or the um, and I guess yeah to really to say this more properly you really should say because uh, u1 and u2 are angular rates yeah and then I can say if u r is a um, linear speed and FR will be have units of force okay so um, this whole idea is central to Keynes approach to finding the equations of motion so Is central to Keynes method. Right. So that was just for particles, a system of particles. You may have rigid bodies in your system too. So what does a generalized active force look like for a rigid body? Um, if you have a rigid body B, in a holonomic uh, system, with n degrees of freedom, in a reference frame A, then um, all forces on this body B can be represented by a resultant uh, force bound to a point Q, any arbitrary point, 
in B, uh, and a torque of a couple. Okay. So if so, you can write the contribution to the arth generalized acting force for that particular body B. And we're going to define that as the partial arth partial velocity of Q in A dotted with the resultant on Q of all the forces plus omega angular velocity of, uh, of B and A, the arth partial of that, dotted with a torque of a couple here on B. So this is the torque torque on the body B and um, resultant on B bound to a line of action through point Q. And then we call this the um, for a single body B. If you have multiple bodies, you've got to add up the contributions to the generalized active force from all the bodies, and then also any of all any of the particles that are in the system too. So uh, Q can be the mass center. of B, but it doesn't have to be. It's common to take the mass center. Okay. All right, so that's how you would do that. Um, and you can look in the online notes uh, where I calculate the generalized active force for system. And we can uh, also, we'll also do that um, together here. All right, so those are generalized active forces. And that completes that. There's also um, the idea of a generalized inertia force. So given a holonomic system, of new particles, um, with n degrees of freedom, n a, and the associated generalized speeds, U1 to Un, then the arth generalized inertia force um, is, or the arth holonomic inertia force is defined as and we use the term FR star is the sum over all new particles, the partial velocity of the ith par particle in this set, Na, dotted with uh, a resultant R star, which this is called the um, uh, inertia force on that particle. 
and uh, r star is defined as minus m the mass of the ith particle times the acceleration of that particle in reference frame A. Right. So this is a uh, the force due to the inertial effects, right? So the mass times acceleration is the force due to the acceleration. It has to be equal to those externally applied forces which come from the generalized active forces. All right. And then similarly, if the system includes a rigid body, then that rigid body's uh, contribution to FR star is defined as this. So this is the rth partial uh, linear velocity of the mass center. In a dotted with r star, which is the inertia force on B, plus the rth angular velocity of B in a dotted with a. Uh, T star, and this is called the inertia torque on B. All right, so now let's define what uh, R star and T star are for this rigid body. So um, R star for this rigid body is defined as the mass of the body B, total mass of the B, negative mass of B times the acceleration of the mass center in the A frame. All right. And then T star. to find a so if the body B is made up a set of uh, beta particles then you can write the sum from I equals 1 over uh, to the beta -th particle it's going to be the mass of the ith particle times the position vector to the particle from the mass center of the collection of particles beta crossed with the acceleration of the ith particle in A. All right. Um, so if I think of the rigid body as a collection of particles and I can sum up all of these cross products over the whole particle, I will get the inertia torque on the body B or that collection of particles. So um, pi equals um, pi for i equals one to beta. Right? These are the particles that make up 
body B. Mi is the mass of Pi, the ith particle. And then you've got that uh, position vector to the ith particle from the mass center. Right, so mass center to the ith particle. And then the acceleration of the ith particle in A. All right, so that gives us the, and I think I missed a negative sign. There should be a negative here. Yep. So that gives you the inertia torque and the inertia force. Now, um, this inertia torque, um, if we have a continuous set of particles, and an inertia dyadic that represents that rigid body instead of a, a collection of particles. You can also write um, for the rigid body that T star equals negative um, the angular velocity of B and A dotted with the central inertia dyadic of the body B minus omega of B and A crossed with the central inertia dyadic of B with respect to B A, the mass center there, and then uh, dotted with omega B and A. So this inertia torque, this captures, um, you know, when we take the time derivative of uh, the angular moment, uh, momentum of the uh, object with a central, uh, central inertia dyadic, then you will get these two terms that will capture the full effect of um, the uh, mass distribution and how it affects the um, acceleration of motion of the of the object okay so this you can use for the whole rigid body it's equivalent to uh, the particle version and you can look in Kane's book to see how to get from there to there all right so just to summarize all this we have the generalized active forces and the generalized inertia forces Um, the generalized active forces map contributing forces um, uh, to generalized speeds. Right. And uh, these are the, you can call these the uh, forcing terms. And then the generalized inertia forces map um, the um, inertial effects to the generalized speeds. If you write um, the Newton-Euler equations, which you should have seen in a prior dynamics of course, for a single rigid body, They look like this, right? The sum of all the forces acting on that body equals the time derivative of the linear momentum. And the sum of all the moments acting on the body about some point equals the time derivative of the angular momentum about that point. Okay? So this is Newton's second law. And Euler's second law. The uh, generalized active forces play the role of this side of the equation. 
for a multi-body system. And then this side of the equation are represented by the generalized inertia forces. All right. So you can now calculate the generalized active forces for particle sets of uh, particles and rigid bodies and the generalized inertia forces. And that's going to give us the two pieces we're going to need to formu formulate the equations of motion of a multi-body system. All right, so I'm going to close. Um, I'll do the example that I have in the book uh, or in the online notes. So uh, that example, let me describe it first. It's going to be this. So we're going to have, uh, all right, we're going to have um, a simple system made up of two rigid bodies. Those are going to be these thin, long rods here, both of length L, and they'll have uh, a mass M, okay? We're going to have uh, gravity acting on these two rods, and they're hanging from a ceiling like a pendulum. Uh, the first rod, A, swings about the um, NZ, AZ direction uh, through an angle of Q2, okay? And then uh, the second rod, B, rotates relative to A about the BX, AX direction through an angle Q2, all right? So we have some three-dimensional uh, uh, coordinates here. Uh, um, the angle Q, uh, the BX and the NZ, they're not aligned. And uh, we'll model each of these as a thin uh, rod, right? Mass centers are in the center at L over 2. They both have a mass M. And the other additional thing here is I'm going to add, we're going to say that there's two torsional springs that uh, resist um, the motion of A with respect to N and then B with respect to A. So we're going to get these two uh, torques that um, will be linear in that particular angle with a spring stiffness K, torsional spring stiffness K. All right, so that's the um, model that we're gonna uh, try to model in, in SimPy. And uh, let me switch screens here. All right, so we're gonna come over here and then I'll make a new notebook. Let's call this uh, generalized forces, okay? And then get our imports. Alright, let's get some constants in here first. We're going to have a spring constant that is K. Um, we're going to have mass. We're going to have the length of the rods, L. And we're going to have an acceleration due to gravity. And I think that's it. K, M, L, G. Uh, we're going to need some coordinates. Q1, Q2 equals ME. Dynamic symbols Q1 and Q2. We're going to have some two generalized speeds U1 and U2. So I think those are the main variables we need. <clears throat> We're going to have N, A, and B. N, A, B. And they will be a reference frame. We're going to need some points to O, B, A, O, and B, O. Okay. I think that's it. I realize my I don't have my uh, picture of me is not in 
the screen. That's okay. I'll deal with it. All right. So we've got these. Um, Setups. Let's set the orientation of reference frame. So a dot orient axis with respect to n. Um, it's going to be through angle q1 about the n z axis, and b dot orient axis with respect to a through angle q2, and that's going to be about the b or the a x direction. So that sets up our two. Um, orientations that we have here. Now we need some velocities. Now we've got two rigid bodies. We're going to need the velocities of AO and BO, right? And we're going to need the angular velocities of each of the bodies. So uh, we want to express those in terms of the generalized speeds. So I'm going to go ahead and say that uh, A dot uh, set angular velocity uh, in in is going to be u1 times nz and b dot set angular velocity in a is going to be u2 times in uh, sorry a dot x so we're going to just use the simple definitions of the generalized speed u uh, equals q dot and then we should be able to use the V2 point theory to get us some uh, velocities. So O, first let's set that velocity in in to zero. And then um, A O dot uh, V2 point theory with uh, it's uh, in the same reference frame as O. We're gonna get want the velocity in in and they both are on A. No connecting path. What did I do? A, orient with the N, B with respect to A. I'm doing that in the wrong order. Other point, out of frame, fixed frame. Oh, I need the positions first, right? So uh, AO dot set position with respect to O. It's going to be L over 2 times A dot X, right? And BO dot set position uh, with respect to O is just L times A dot X also. Now we can get the velocities of AO dot V2 point theory with respect to O um, in N. They're both in A. There we go. And then BO dot V two point theory O N and A. All right, so we've got our velocities there in terms of uh, the U. So let's check also A dot angular velocity in N and B dot angular velocity in N. There we go. We've got all our velocities are all in terms of the U's and. Um, we do need some um, partial velocities at this point. So um, there's a nice function called me.partialvelocity. And you can give it uh, a list of velocity vectors and then a list of generalized speeds and then the frame you want to end to get all of those partial velocities. So if I do. Um, AO dot velocity and in N. Or AO either, yeah, AO dot velocity and in N. BO dot velocity and in N. and then A dot angular velocity in N and B dot angular velocity in N. Those are our Velocities we're interested in. We've got u1 and u2 as the partials, and then it's all in the n frame. So that gives me all of the partial velocities there. And um, we can also do these manually, and maybe that's good for the first time. So let's do uh, the velocity in n of AO. 
with respect to the first um, generalized speed. It's going to be ao.velocity and in dot with u1. Just to see that we get a matching result as above there. Um, not dot. What am I trying to do? Part uh, diff diff in in v1. I think I got those u1 in. There we go. So we see that we get that. At partial velocity there. All right, so I can go through and I got uh, AO with respect to two, so that would be change that, and then let's do BO one and two, BO, BO one and two, and then omega of uh, B in and A and N. One is going to be a dot angular velocity n n dot diff u one and n. And then we do two and two two and then it'll be b b b two all right that should give us the six angular velocity uh, partial velocities all right i think those are correct so we've got our partial velocities now we could do uh, the generalized active forces but we need the resultants on these things all right so um, the resultant on AO is we don't have to worry about the non-contributing forces. So we only have um, a uh, M. Uh, we got it. We, we never introduced our masses. So I need. Did I? Did I only, only I've got M, but I have. Oh, yeah, they're both mass m, so we do have that. So let's uh, do that. We'll have a resultant at AO equals mass times g times n dot x. It's in the n dot x direction. Resultant on BO equals m times g times n dot x, right? And then we've got the um, resultant torque, okay? We've got these springs to deal with. So on um, A, uh, if I uh, have a positive Q1, I'm going to Q1 times the spring constant K in the in Z direction. It's going to give a negative, we're going to say a negative force, so it resists uh, the motion. So if I give a positive opening Q1, the spring force is going to be pulling it in the other direction. So that's uh, uh, that spring force. And then let's do B here first. Similarly, it'll be a negative Q2 times K times uh, B dot X, all right? But we have to have then the reaction force back on the A from B. So that'll be a positive Q2 times K times B dot X. All right, I think those are the results for our generalized active forces. So then we can do F1, right? It's going to be um, the uh, partial of AO1 dotted with RAO, and then plus the PO one dotted with R B O plus um, Omega A one dotted with 
A plus omega of B when dotted with T B. And then similarly, F2, we should just be able to go through and change all the ones to twos, because now we're dealing with the second generalized active force. Boom. All right, so these are the generalized active forces acting on the system. All right. Now we can do the generalized inertia forces. So we're going to need the um, R star, R star AO is going to be negative of the mass times, and then we're going to have the um, uh, AO dot ACC in N. And let's make sure that looks like we're expecting. It's only in terms of the U's and the U dots. All right, so that's a good sign. And then we should be able to do a BO equals negative M times BO dot ACC and N. RS BO also looks good. Okay, so those are the inertia forces on the two bodies. Now we get a T star on A. Okay, and we'll type out the full piece here so it's uh, proper but you have an um, uh, before we do that though we need the central inertia tensors right so let's define that um, the moment of inertia of a thin rod about its mass center right is going to be a um, it's going is going to be I'll just call it I equals I think it's M L squared m times l squared over 12 i believe is the right thing so uh, the thin rod wouldn't have any um, moment of inertia about its long axis but around um, the axes normal to its long axis any axis is going to be m l squared over 12 i believe so then we should be able to create m i uh, of a with respect to ao right the central inertia dyadic is going to be i times um, and the first one is uh, about a y and z y. So we can do um, me dot outer a y comma a y plus i times me dot outer a dot z a dot z. So it has no moment of inertia about x. That looks right. And then i b b o equals i times me dot outer. And then the B one has no about none about the Y, so we do BX, BX, and then plus I times M E dot outer uh, B Z and B Z. Let's have a look at those to see if see what they look like. All right. So that should give our um, inertia dyadic of these two bodies. Now we can do the T star uh, with respect to A. All right. So T star with respect to A is N uh, is negative um, A dot angular acceleration in N. Okay. And then it's dotted with I A A O. Then also minus this uh, second term, which we do a cross product me dot cross of um, a dot angular velocity in n with i a a o. That's the cross product, and then you will dot that with a dot angular velocity. And in so let's um, 
I'm just going to put all these in parentheses and then I'll take the negative out so we can see it and I think that's boom T S A all right for a it looks like you know all we get is this inertia term times the u1 dot which is a basic simple pendulum rod um, which makes sense I think so the TS T star B though should be a little more complicated so now we change this to B B B B B B B and then T star B here we go been nastier right so we've got that second body there the ingotter the acceleration and uh, it, it captures a bit more interesting dynamics all right so I think those are correct so we've got our R star and a P star, we should be able to form our generalized inertia forces. So we're going to say F star one. And these are going to look a lot like these equations here. So I'm just going to grab a F star one. And then we're going to do a partial velocity, but now we're doing R star. And uh, R star, T star, T star. I think that's it, F star one. And then um, we should be able to just change all those to twos to get the R F star two. Two, 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 two. Hmm. All right, I think we have our FR equals F1, F2, generalize active forces, and then F R uh, star. F uh, S1, F S2. All right. That's a basic two-body uh, system. It has uh, these torques and gravity that are contributing forces and torques. And uh, we've got some more interesting dynamics. And we end up with our FR and FR star, generalized active forces, generalized inertia forces. So hopefully I didn't make a mistake there. If I did, let me know. Um, and we can repair the notebook, but that, uh, that should be about right. We can check it also against the answers in the uh, assignment. Okay, that uh, long video, but um, this is the uh, magic moment where we are approaching the, the doing the, the hard hitting part of getting the equations of motion finally after we've put all the pieces together. Okay, I'll see you later.